Okay, so off we go. We uh, Last time, uh, we, we finished up talking about Gauss's divergence theorem, at least sort of our first pass through that. Uh, there are more things that I'm going to say uh, that involve the divergence theorem a little, little bit later. And, of course, a bunch of examples at the end. Uh, so uh, the next big theorem, Stokes's curl theorem. So this, again, has a lot in common with theorems that we've seen before. So um, I, I'm going to go through the ideas in the same order, again, just for the purpose of, of emphasizing the extreme common sort of shared features, you know, the, the strong analogies between all these theorems. So Again, we have a, a specific idea of boundary that we have to understand. So uh, in particular, if you have a, uh, a, a surface, and again, keep in mind, a surface sits up in space. Uh, furthermore, keep in mind, we're talking about now oriented surfaces. So these are not just surfaces that uh, just kind of sit there. They have a well-defined normal direction, you know, a perpendicular direction that defines which way is the positive direction through the surface. Okay, so uh, our surface here has a normal vector, little n, unit normal vector. Uh, now, uh, what is the boundary of a surface? Well, the boundary of a surface, of course, is kind of what you might call the edge. You know, where does the surface end? Uh, if there were an ant crawling around on your surface, where would the ant get confused? Where would he feel like, hey, what's going on? I don't, there's nothing over there. I can't go any further. Right? Um, <clears throat> so now on this picture, you can see where the boundary would be. The boundary is going to be this curve, kind of like that. But again, this being uh, a boundary, the word boundary being a loaded word, again, for all of chapter 6 and 7, it is a loaded word. Boundary does not mean just a set of points. It means an oriented set of points, right? So um, we're talking now about an... Uh, I circled the wrong thing. We're talking about uh, an, an oriented boundary curve. Which of the two possible orientations... Right? I mean, this curve, I could go that way or I could go this way. How do you know? What's the, what's the rule that's, that indicates what orientation is attached to this boundary? And the rule is uh, as follows. Um, <clears throat> let's see here, and let me uh, uh, highlight here, uh, oriented surface uh, here, oriented by our normal vector. Okay, so the rule that tells you which way to go it's another sort of physical gesture, um, like other things that we saw back in chapter one. It involves the right hand, the human right hand. Here's what you do. This oriented surface that you're starting with, again, is oriented. It has a normal vector. Point your thumb in the direction that that, that, that normal vector, that orientation points for your original surface. Look at the fingers of your right hand. Notice that your fingers sort of curl around your thumb, if you will, in a pretty specific direction, right? I mean, and again, no hand yoga, no you know, cheating, right? Just bend fingers the way the fingers want to bend. And as I have it drawn here, thumb like this, looking at the way my fingers are pointing, um, what I'm going to call the swirl here, the swirl around the normal vector is like that. Does everybody buy it? Again, right hand, all that. The correct orientation for your boundary curve is whichever direction is the direction that this swirl sideswipes up against that boundary curve. So uh, in particular, uh, you, you look at the way this swirl is going, and it's going kind of that way. As if you were to kind of drag this little swirly shape, just kind of drag it over to where it sort of starts to brush up against the boundary, and you can see that it would go in that direction. Not not back this way, right? That way. Is everybody on board? It's very geometric. Uh, rule, it's a lot harder to describe, right? We had a relatively easy rule with uh, when we were talking about Green's theorem. It's just I mean, it's pretty much counterclockwise, right? You got to watch out for uh, uh, you know special weird cases, but it's basically counterclockwise uh, with solids as per Gauss's divergence theorem. It's yeah, outward 
pretty much. And again, weird special counterexamples. But uh, this one is a weird, you know, it doesn't have, there is no sort of single word sort of uh, uh, direction. Please do not make the mistake of thinking that it's always counterclockwise. In fact, if you're talking about curves in space, I don't even know what counterclockwise means, right? Look at my finger rotating, or am I, is my finger rotating around clockwise or counterclockwise? Well, from where y'all are sitting, it probably looks counterclockwise. From where I'm standing, it looks pretty clockwise, <laughs> right? So there, it's not even a meaningful term, right? So uh, again, please don't, uh, please don't oversimplify this one. You have to use the, the right-hand uh, rule. Okay. No surprise, we're going to talk about accumulation. Uh, again, if you're, going to, if you're going to develop an integral, the quantity in question has to be an accumulating quantity. The whole has to be the sum of the parts. You all have heard this a million times. Um, I claim we have a, an accumulating quantity. In this case, the accumulating quantity is boundary circulation. Specifically, boundary circulation com accumulates over surfaces. So that is specifically if you have a what you might call a whole surface and you talk about its boundary circulation, again, keep in mind, boundary. Boundary is a very uh, loaded word. Boundary means oriented in a certain way. So our surface, our oriented surface here, oriented like so, fingers, swirl, side swipes. The, uh, the boundary is oriented... Uh, this way, right? And now we ask, what happens if we cut this into two separate pieces? If we cut this into sort of a left side and a right side? Well, on the left side, I get this. And on the right side, again, fingers, swirls, and all that. Uh, and I get that. And the, uh, the, the concerning bit is this edge in the middle, but notice, as with every other theorem that we've seen along these lines, this edge appears twice with an opposite orientations and it cancels. Right? So the thing that makes, you know, the theorem that we're in the process of developing, the thing that makes it work, the thing that allows it to be a consideration of an accumulating quantity in the first place is this cancellation, which is an immediate consequence of how we defined boundary orientations. Right? So this is, this is why boundary orientations are so important. It's what makes the theorem work right? in the first place. So huge, big deal. And uh, thankfully, again, as a result, we have, a, uh, we have an accumulating quantity. So uh, notice this uh, smacks of uh, Green's theorem. Right? Green's theorem is also a theorem that results from viewing boundary circulation as an accumulating quantity. The only difference between Green's theorem and Stokes' curl theorem uh, is that the former uh, is exclusive to R2 and the latter is exclusive to R3. That's it. That's a little details that follow as a consequence of that, but that's they're otherwise extremely similar theorems. Okay, uh, you know, again, we've been down this road a bunch of times, but when you have an accumulating quantity, it doesn't matter how many pieces you chop it up into, you're always going to have, on each sort of sliced edge, you're going to have uh, that as part of the boundary of uh, two of the pieces, always with opposite orientations, they always cancel. Likewise, with every other accumulating quantity we've ever seen, I can view the whole as the sum of the parts in that the boundary circulation of the whole is the sum of the boundary circulations on each little piece. And so it's perfectly reasonable for me to, you know, to the question, hey, how much of this yellow boundary circulation is coming from this green piece? And the answer is very simple. We'll just look at the boundary circulation on the green piece, right? So even though the boundary circulation on the whole you know, we, t we think of it um, uh, uh, ultimately kind of naively. We think of it as happening on the boundary. Again, that's a misdirect. That's, not the, that's, um, that's really not the right way to think about it, in my opinion. Uh, better to think about it as something that's happening on the whole 
and therefore that we can view it as actually happening in you know piece by piece in specific locations in the interior. All right. So in other words, it behaves like a stuff. Again, just like every other accumulating quantity we've seen. Okay. With that in mind, we can talk about densities. And again, I hope this all seems familiar. We've been we've gone through this sort of sequence of of, uh, of uh, related, you know, analogous arguments. This is like our sixth pass through. I, I've lost track. Right? But anyway, um, what do we mean by density? Well, circulation being an accumulating quantity, I can talk about how much circulation there is on this piece. Keep in mind, of course, when I say circulation, I mean boundary circulation. I mean circulation around the boundary. I didn't draw it on the boundary, right? Because even though we measure it on the boundary, it's really to be thought of as something on the surface itself. So the amount of boundary circulation that there is for that piece can be thought of as a distribution over the area of that piece. And as such, we can talk about this associated density. This uh, accumulating quantity in question being circulation, uh, we call this, no surprise, circulation density. Just like flux density for the divergence theorem, just like change density for the fundamental theorem of line integrals and the fundamental theorem of calculus. Everybody with me? So when we say circulation density, this is what we mean, and uh, conveniently there is a formula for it. Also, arguably conveniently for y'all, I'm not going to walk you through how to derive this formula for circulation density. It's a bunch of details. Um, there is something weird about this result. Uh, notice that the circulation density does not depend only on the vector field. The circulation density uh, depends on both the vector field, which you see there, but it also depends on my piece of surface. Specifically, it depends on how your piece of surface is oriented. It depends on how your piece of surface is sitting in space and thereby what is its normal vector. All right, so that's a little bit weird. We, we didn't see that with... Um, but on the theorem of calculus, it only depends on f. Right? That's all you need to know. It's the derivative. End of story. There's no orientation right? when you're talking about change density for the fundamental theorem of calculus. Uh, divergence, this is a formula. Depends on the vector field, period. Nothing else. Right? So this is uh, an eyebrow raiser that um, our circulation density actually depends also on the orientation of the surface. And I'm going to come back and talk about that in a minute. Um, in fact, uh, you may recall, but I will remind you, and again, in a few minutes, we have seen something like this before. And I get more, more discussion on that in a couple. Okay, so we put the pieces together. We've got everything we need. Uh, circulation is thought of as a formula, but we're going to choose here instead to view it as being a quantity. Um, <clears throat> as a stuff, I'm going to call it sigma for circulation. Um, it is an accumulating quantity. The whole is the sum of the parts. That's a really big, that's one of the cornerstone points that makes the theorem that we're developing here uh, work. That the whole is the sum of the parts. Right? Circulation, chop it up, add it up. And then, looking at any little part, any little bitty piece, a piece of circulation relates to the corresponding piece of area by way of its circulation density. And again, we've talked about uh, circulation density here. Circulation density is this formula, curl dot n. So our first cut through uh, of our theorem is this right here that I have in purple. Uh, let me erase the uh, distractions. Oh, whoa. Here, our, our first cut through the theorem says circulation is this surface integral. 
And, you know, this is kind of, uh, I'm going to say, sort of what we were expecting our theorem to look like structurally, right? We're, we're adding up over little pieces of area. Not surprising that we have an integral where the differential is ds area. Sort of what we were expecting. But then we notice, and this is, uh, you know, I, I'm going to say we weren't necessarily expecting this. It's not just that there's a ds here. There is an n ds. That is a ds vector. So we were kind of expecting, in some sense, for this to be a scalar surface integral. But in fact, just how it has turned out, it is a vector surface integral. Is that cool? Everybody happy with that? All right. So uh, you can uh, view this theorem a couple of different ways. If you have a line integral to compute, and uh, for whatever reason, if that's difficult, if that's something that uh, you don't really want to have to do, hey, cool, no problem. Here is a flux, which might end up being easier to compute. You never know. Worth a shot. <laughs> right. um, in some cases, you can use this the other way around. Uh, there's problems with this, but uh, if uh, another another interpretation of an equal sign, if you find yourself wanting to compute a flux, and here there's a very painfully obvious asterisk. If you are computing a flux, and if specifically if the flux that you are computing is a flux of a curl of something, right? then uh, you can compute that flux as this line integral. Of course, in order to make that work, you need to know what is the vector field whose curl I actually have. In other words, you would need to know the anti-curl. And uh, mm, bad news, um, just so you know, we, we're not going to develop any tools for finding anti-curls in this class. Um, it's, uh, it's not as easy as finding anti-gradients. Anti-gradients is a pretty straightforward method. Right? You look at various anti-partials. It just kind of works out. Anti-curl is hard. It's not something we can really quite do. Okay. Um, cool. So, uh, yeah, theorem. Let's uh, give it a try. Here we go. We're going to compute a line integral. Uh, we have a vector field given, and we have a curve given. How are we going to compute this line integral? Very first thing I want to point out, this is always mm, pretty much uh, assume that the following will always be the case. Notice nowhere in the statement of the question did it say to use Stokes' curl theorem. Right? So what I'm, uh, when, I, when I'm giving you this, this, uh, this, um, this new tool called uh, Stokes' Curl Theorem, it's just a tool in your toolbox. You have to make the decision of whether this particular integral, you know, should I take this parameterization? My gosh, it's already parameterized. Maybe I should pull back through the parameterization. That's, that's for you to decide. Right? Um, or, oh, hey, I wonder, maybe I might use the fundamental theorem of line integrals. After all, this is a line integral, and you would think fundamental theorem of line integrals sounds pretty good, right? That might be, maybe, possibly. That's, again, something for you to decide whether that's what you want to try. Or now we have our third option, Stokes' curl theorem. And, again, you have to decide if that's the... The, the way to do it. Um, real quick, I will point out that if you were to try to do this with um, <clears throat> the uh, uh, plug and chug, you know, pulling back through the parameterization, uh, your formula for x is trig ish, and then, but worse, your formula for y, not so much because of that, but because of that. Now you have trig in your exponential. And so this is, you know, I'm not saying it can't be done, right? But it's, that's not nice. Um, that's uh, discouraging, right? That makes sense to everybody? Okay. Okay. So we're going to, oh, what about fundamental thermal line integrals? Why wouldn't I use fundamental thermal line integrals here? It's kind of hard to see this coming. And it does seem like, hey, maybe the fundamental theorem of line integrals might be worth a shot. Um, turns out, you can't. Fundamental theorem of line integrals will not work for this example. 
And you've got to remember that uh, the fundamental theorem of line integrals, again, it has an asterisk. All these theorems have, a, have a, an asterisk. There is a fine print. The asterisk on the fundamental theorem of line integrals is it only works if there actually is an anti-gradient. For this vector field, there's not going to be an anti-gradient, as it turns out. If you try to find an anti-gradient, it's one of those unwinnable games where, as you try to you know, uh, strategize and find that anti-gradient, you won't. It's not going to work. There is none. It's a losing game. Okay. All right. So we'll use Stokes' curl theorem. Um, <clears throat> my usual reminder, if you have a line integral and you want to use Stokes' curl theorem to rewrite that as a, uh, as a flux for possible advantage, uh, a reminder, uh, again, asterisk, this does not work for any line integral. It only works for special line integrals. The asterisk in this case, we've seen this before, it's got to be a boundary. Very important. One of the reasons, I guess you, know, you could argue that it has to be a boundary, is look at how we got here. Right? It was only, specifically only because we were looking at boundary circulations in the first place that we got this whole idea of accumulation. So the thing crashes and burns Badly, the argument supporting the result crashes. And you can't even begin the argument, right? Um, unless this is a boundary. Right? Um, on a more sort of practical level, uh, it's got to be a boundary because you need to know what it's a boundary of. Because whatever it's a boundary of, that's the domain for your new flux integral, right? So if your line integral isn't a boundary then there is no anti-boundary, as I like to call them. And if there is no anti-boundary, then there is no double integral here. right? And so just like we saw, I, you know, I went on this rant uh, for one of these earlier theorems, it's not that the two integrals aren't equal. It's that there is no flux integral for the line integral to be equal to. So anyway, very important point. So now we have to think about how that relates to our example here. And let's, uh, let's uh, let me erase the, there we go. So let's look at our curve here. Again, our curve was given already parametrized, which is kind of nice. Curve C, parametrized like that. And you can persuade yourself without too much trouble that it is um, uh, kind of like this. Uh, by the way, how did I come up with this geometric interpretation, this curve? interpreting from this. There's different ways to think about it. I just noticed that this looks an awful lot like cosine t sine t zero, which I already know. And then I just think, well, this minus sign is just a reflection. right? And so while having it the other way would have been what you might call counterclockwise as looking from, from where we sit above, this one's clockwise as seen from above. Everybody good? All right, now here's where our students make a mistake very commonly. A lot of students will uh, be suspicious of the idea that this could be a boundary of this disk because, wait a minute, isn't it, you know, I mean, there's all this formality talk about the right hand and stuff, but uh, come on, isn't it supposed to be counterclockwise? And this isn't, as we're looking at it here, counterclockwise. And so some students would say this is not a boundary. And you can see the temptation. But it is a boundary. It's perfectly okay. No problem with boundary. It's a boundary of this yellow uh, disk oriented downward, namely using this as our orientation vector. Uh, remember, we're not talking just about surfaces. We're talking about oriented surfaces. So um, this blue curve is oriented in the direction that my fingers go if I just turn my thumb upside down. Does that make sense, everybody? All right. So um, anyway, uh, there is absolutely no need to uh, talk about how, well, this curve is the opposite orientation of a different curve, which is a boundary. This one's already a boundary. You just have to infer the correct normal vector. Okay. Cool. So uh, it's a boundary. Knowing it's a boundary, 
Uh, I can write down uh, Stokes' curl theorem. Stokes' curl theorem says that a boundary circulation is a flux of curl. Here's Stokes' curl theorem right there. Uh, let's see here. Now I've got some details to worry about, and you know how do I compute this flux? And again, you know there's uh, there's always options. You know how you compute this flux. Uh, I suppose you could parameterize that surface or something, right? And in some cases, some cases you have to. Uh, but sometimes you get lucky, and I do encourage you always to be on the lookout for good fortune. Um, it's really convenient. The the world is full of good luck. And so don't, you know, walk away from freebies. Uh, the freebie in this case is that our normal vector, I can see it right here. It's just pointing in the downward direction from this flat disk that's entirely horizontal. And so it's just very simply 0, 0, negative 1, like so. Uh, and uh, let's see here. And then, of course, I've got to compute the curl. The curl of my vector field is, uh, it's, uh, oh gosh, certain uh, details. You know, you got to take various specific partials of specific coordinates and subtract sp some from the others and make sure, you're, make sure you remember the formula for how to compute curl. All right? that's, a, that's a mechanical thing you just have to know and be good at. So the good luck in this case is that not only is this normal vector easy to write down, but furthermore, this dot product, this dot product right here, works out to not only be convenient, it's also even better, it's a constant, it's super convenient, right? And so uh, now again, we have a scalar integral with a constant bound on a barnyard variety geometric shape, and real easy to compute this integral this integral is minus 2 pi. Everybody buy it? Okay. All right. So there you go. That's uh, the basics of Stokes' curl theorem. And now uh, various other things to talk about. Uh, let's see here. I'm going to start by talking about this idea of oriented density. I'm gonna this, we're going to start with a flashback to the fundamental theorem of line integrals. Uh, here, and this is a, almost exactly a copy of what I had written down um, uh, back in chapter six. That you know we found uh, our, our change density. Our formula for change density was this. Um, and uh, by the way, just to connect uh, connect to uh, the, my previous foreshadowing, I made the observation when we wrote down our formula for for. The, for the circulation density here, I claim this was not our first time to see a density that had an orientation in it. And this is it. Right? So when we fundamental theorem of line integrals, the change density, the relevant density for what we're talking about, has the orientation in it as part of the uh, part of that density. And what did we do in that case? Well, uh, we rewrote this, as previously done, as uh, the dx vector, and then we just uh, said, okay, well, look, if, if density is what you multiply by size to get change, then oriented density, wouldn't it be reasonable for that to be whatever you multiply by oriented size, keep in mind dx is literally just the size of your little piece of curve but with the orientation built into it. Right? So uh, oriented density times si uh, oriented size also gives you change. Just a kind of a different way of thinking about the density. Right? So we had this idea of an orient, oh whoopsie, color problem. Uh, we had this idea of an oriented change density uh, as, as a natural interpretation of the gradient vector. So uh, <clears throat> I'm going to do the exact same thing down here. And again, some of this we've already written down, right? We've already written down this. Circulation is an accumulating quantity. The whole is the sum of the parts. 
the density as previously noted is this right here there's our circulation density again it has a orientation built into it and just like we did above and as we have already done we're going to observe well that means that I can in, I can kind of glue these together interpret that as my ds vector which I'm going to interpret it as an oriented area because that's what the ds vector is right it's it's the orientation combined with the area I think oriented area is a pretty reasonable thing to call it right and with that in mind um, <clears throat> In the same way that density times area gives you circulation, well, likewise, oriented density times oriented area likewise gives you circulation. Just a point of view. Uh, and again, it gets us to this, uh, what I think is a really nice, uh, whoops, I just erased the wrong thing, really nice point of view on how to think about curl. Um, it's a uh, commonly sort of uh, poorly understood thing of, you know, what is curl, you know, it, other than it's the thing that you stick inside of the flux integral to make the theorem work, right? That, that part is, um, is uh, transparent. But uh, how do you think about <coughs> curl? What does it look like? How should I, what should my intuition about, if I'm going to picture and visualize curl, where should that come from? Well, this is, I think, a pretty good, uh, pretty good starting point for that. It's a, where it's a tool for understanding circulation. It is a local thing, thus a density. It's, uh, you know, you got to multiply by area to get an actual circulation. But then furthermore, the direction that the curl points is telling you about, in some sense, the orientation of that circulation. Okay, now let me go back to the fundamental theorem of line integrals. Again, right above. Back up to here. This oriented density, oriented change density has a magnitude and a direction. Let's break it up into magnitude and direction. What can I say about its magnitude? Well, the magnitude is the magnitude of the gradient. We, we already know stuff about the magnitude of the gradient. The magnitude of the gradient tells you how steep the graph is. It tells you what's the maximal rate of change with respect to distance traveled in that direction. Right? It's all these old interpretations of, uh, of uh, the magnitude of the gradient. But I like to think of it as uh, look, if you're going in the best possible direction, if you're going in the direction that makes the change happen as much as possible, then this is telling you how, how, uh, how much change density there is with the understanding that you're going in that maximal direction. And, of course, the direction that it points, again, old news, the direction that it points is that maximal direction. This is the direction you would go to make the change as much as possible. So we get the same interpretations out of curl. And again, I think this is a really important intuition to have. When you take curl and break it up into a magnitude and a direction, likewise, the direction that the curl points, it tells you... It, in around which direction, around which axis, uh, what direction should I point my normal vector orientation in order to have my boundary actually picking up, noticing, experiencing the maximum amount of circulation? This is the what you might call the best possible direction for your surface to be oriented in order to experience the, the, uh, the circulation that this vector field is putting out there. Right? So that's the, the direction of the rotation axis. And then the magnitude is, again, a kind of a measure of, uh, yeah, okay, and in that direction, how much rotation are we really talking about? Right? Is this a, is this a uh, what do they call them, a Category 5 tornado type thing, right? where there's just tremendous 
the, the fluid is rotating very, very strongly, or perhaps is it uh, sort of a gentle twist, sort of a gentle turning, something like that. Okay. Um, now, bad news, what I have in green here, the magnitude of the gradient. We had a really good geometric sense for how to quantify this because it's the slope of the graph. We could be extremely precise about what we mean by slope and therefore exactly geometrically how to interpret this very literally. Right? Um, not really so here. Uh, the magnitude of the curl, I'm not going to be able to, it just, we don't, the picture isn't conducive to being able to say precisely, you know, what, what is the exact geometric interpretation. But the idea is the bigger the magnitude, the stronger the tornado, the more violent the rotation is of the fluid. Okay. So um, I do want to, uh, so first of all, I'll document that right here, the, the curl vector. That curl vector uh, is telling you, again, two things. Uh, by its direction, it's telling you around what line is the rotation of the fluid happening. And by its magnitude... Right? It's telling you in some sense how, oh gosh, how fast, how much, how strongly, however you want to say it, right? Um, in some sense, and let's not worry about units, that's somebody else's problem. Um, how much of a rotation are we talking about here? All right. So now, I, just for intuition purposes, I, I like to draw the following uh, picture. Um, this is actually intended to be just two identical drawings of the exact same vector field. And I'm going to talk about, so think of this as really one vector field. Right? It's two pictures of the same thing. Um, and let's talk about how curl relates to circulation uh, as pertains to uh, the surface around which we're interested. And so on the one hand, I'm going to think about this yellow surface right here. And on the other hand, I'm going to think about this uh, green surface uh, over here. And uh, for each one of these surfaces, I can talk about the boundary circulation of our vector field, same vector field, around both of these boundaries. Uh, notice that these two uh, surfaces over here, the yellow one, the green one, uh, they're about the same size or intended to be the same size. The main difference being that this one is oriented one way and this other one is just importantly oriented a different way. Same amount of area, just arranged differently in space. Okay. So how does the curl and the normal vector, in some sense, why should we, I be interested in how those relate to each other? And I'll remind you, going back to uh, our picture, the circulation density, as we're seeing here, the circulation density is curl dot n. Why is curl dot n uh, relevant to my attempt to understand how much circulation we're talking about on this piece? So it's just a matter of kind of looking at the picture. Uh, as pertains to this first yellow surface here, notice the vector field is doing like that. Notice that the boundary around which we're interested in the circulation is going like that. And I ask rhetorically, uh, to what extent is this flow, this fluid flow, to what extent is it flowing along that boundary? Well, it really is. It's flowing along that boundary a lot. Right? I mean, as the, as the boundary turns, the field kind of turns along with it. There's a tremendous amount of uh, vector line integral being picked up all the way around that boundary curve. So we expect for there to be a lot of, uh, of boundary circulation. What does this have to do with curl in the normal vector? Notice just, just from the geometry that the way that this fluid is circulating the same way as this boundary lines up perfectly with how the curl vector is parallel 
to the normal vector. All right. So if you're interested in fluid circulating around the boundary, you can see how much they are kind of going along with each other by looking and seeing to what extent the curl and the normal vector are pointing in the same direction. And of course, that's, uh, that's what a dot product does. Okay. Now, by contrast, same vector field. Um, let's look now at, let's see here, how am I going to do this? Uh, let me uh, do this. Same vector field, same flow, yada, yada, yada. Uh, now, looking at uh, this piece of surface here. And, uh, okay, well, look, the boundary, boundary there is really not going in the same direction as the fluid, right? The, uh, the, the fluid is kind of rotating this way. I don't know if I have the coordination to pull this off, but the, the, this is the rotation of the fluid, right? And then this is the rotation of the boundary. It's just different, right? Uh, if you were to keep track as you move along this curve, well, over here, the fluid is kind of flowing perpendicular to the curve kind of that way. And then as you come around and you're on the back side of the curve, well, on that side, the fluid is kind of, again, perpendicular to the curve going the other <coughs> way. We're not expecting there to be any line integral here. The Fluid flow and the boundary are just, they're, they're going in completely different directions. To what extent does the dot product notice this? Well, it notices it pretty well, right? Uh, the dot product we'd be interested in then would be curl dot normal vector. And in the same way that these... Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the fluid flow and the boundary are just kind of orthogonal to each other. Well, the normal vector and the curl are kind of orthogonal to each other. So I think it's tracks, right? I mean, the idea of looking at the dot, you know, curl dot normal vector is just a fancy, algebraically convenient way to notice how much of the circulation that's happening is happening in a direction that's relevant to the boundaries. Uh, whose circulations I actually want. Okay, so uh, this is just for sort of geometric sort of satisfaction purposes. Okay, a couple of physical examples. Um, uh, we're going to be quick with this. This is um, analogous to things we've seen before and or uh, physics that is uh, going to be taught in the physics class, but I just kind of want to foreshadow and let you know what, what you're going to see there. Um, so we have previously seen, for example, that if you have a uh, leaf, and this still being vaguely fall outside, I'm going to color that orange. There's our leaf uh, presumably floating uh, downstream in some creek or river or whatever. And you look at the, uh, the let's suppose that the fluid is flowing kind of like that, which, by the way, is not rare at all in rivers, that it's faster in the middle of the river, slower near the, the, near the bank. Um, and so what would we expect this leaf to do? Well, of course, we would expect for it to rotate. In this case, I would expect it to rotate counterclockwise because, well, it's being pushed harder, if you will, kind of on uh, the one side more than the other. Just thinking about how the physics of that would work. I feel like this should be rotating like that. And that rotation is picked up by Green's operator, right? Green's operator is what tells you about that rotation and what you should expect and which direction you should expect things to be rotating. Um, so likewise, sort of a three-dimensional analog of that. Instead of a, instead of a two-dimensional thing that's being pushed by a two-dimensional fluid, let's now imagine a three-dimensional thing that's being pushed around by a three-dimensional fluid. And my favorite easy, obvious uh, example of this would be a balloon, right? So think of happy birthday balloon, right? Uh, but I, had, I have to modify a little bit. I need my balloon to just kind of sit. I need it to have uh, uh, perfect buoyancy. It can't be full of helium and up against the ceiling, no fair, right? It can't be 
out of helium and just kind of sitting on the floor. I need it to be in that perfect state where it's just perfectly buoyant. And then also no knot down at the bottom. The knot at the bottom is going to make it hang with the knot at the bottom for just gravity reasons, not what I want to talk about. Right? So imagine a, uh, a, a balloon with no knot, air bubble, right? soap bubble. Soap bubbles would be pretty good. And uh, so uh, what, uh, how is this thing going to be rotating if I have an uh, airflow given by a vector field? Um, well, in the same way that Green's operator tells me the rotation in two dimensions, Curl is going to tell me how it rotates, how this balloon rotates in three dimensions. Because after all, curl is literally, uh, let's see, let me do it like this. Curl is, oh, this picture is getting a little muddy. Let me just clean that up. Uh, curl is literally going to be pointing perpendicular to the uh uh, to the what you might call the rotation, or it's pointing parallel to the axis. It's telling you what is the axis that the air is rotating, and if the air is rotating around like that, then that would uh, you would expect that to be how the balloon would be rotating as well. Everybody buy it? So again, note the strong analogy with Green's operator and the rotation of floating leaves. Um, so again, a little bit of physics, and again, this isn't a physics class, and uh, so let's not get lost in physics here, but um, uh, something that y'all are going to see if you take a uh, uh, E&M course, uh, I guess they may, they may call that physics 2 or whatever, uh, if you take an E&M course or if you have taken an E&M course, you might recall that when you have a current, uh, current being, uh, actually let me do this in blue, I like the blue better. Reminds me of the water metaphor. Oh, and my thing is out of charge. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> do this in blue. Oops. If I have a flow, this time a flow of charged particles. This is called a current field. As I think probably most of y'all know, current means charged particles moving through a wire. This is just a generalization of that idea. Instead of having charged particles moving confined to within a wire, this just says, yeah, I just have I have charged particles and they're just moving in space, right? This is a this is a general general flow of charged particles. Um, the uh, physics of it all empirically, no one knows why, but we have observed that as the flow is that way, the magnetic field that is created uh, goes uh, kind of like this. Um, uh, Trying to emphasize that it's kind of behind uh, these. It's uh, sort of behind the, the charged particles over there and in front of the charged particles over here. So uh, again, right hand, thumb in the direction of the current, fingers pointing in the direction of the flow of the magnetic field. Um, and it turns out um, that uh, there's certain things that you can empirically observe about this. And uh, for one thing, uh, let's see here, I'll write down uh, a, a relatively easy observation. Um, uh, ignoring this constant right here, this mu naught, this just says current is the flux of the flow field. That's kind of the definition of uh, current, depending on how you think about it, arguably a definition of a flow field. Take your pick. But uh, again, other than that constant, that's uh, sort of an immediate uh, immediate conclusion. Uh, we throw the constant in for free. We throw that constant in so that when I look at this second equation here, uh, I'll get what we empirically measure. It turns out that whenever you have uh, a closed loop um, and if you have a current flowing through your, the sort of inside of your closed loop, you can empirically measure 
the circulation, the overall total circulation of the magnetic field around that closed loop. And again, this physics is not my problem, right? But uh, this is just straight up empirical. That said, well, we know that circulation is a uh, flux of curl. Stokes' curl theorem. And that means that these two integrals, these two integrals are always the same for any surface. How about that? That's weird. These flux integrals are always the same no matter what. Well, that means that these two integrands are the same. And that means that the curl of the magnetic field created by a current flow is the current flow field itself. And a constant, you know, empirical. This is just units. It's nothing to worry about. So a uh, neat fact. Um, and again, it's kind of uh, uh, powerful that we get this uh, really powerful, neat interpretation um, that, uh, uh, you know, from a sort of an empirically observed whole statement about you know, uh, finite currents and finite circulations, um, you get uh, a conclusion, a local conclusion called Maxwell's fourth equation, um, uh, and uh, that tells you about the direct relationship between the field itself and the magnetic field that's a result, and the, the thing that made it happen is Stokes' curl theorem. Right? So as you study e and M, Stokes' curl theorem bonkers powerful in helping you understand, for example, magnetic fields and currents. Y'all have a good day. See you later. See you on Monday. Okay.